I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, HDIAC. Today's presentation is entitled DITRA and Future Directions for Nuclear Detection R&D. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the HDIAC Outreach Manager. <clears throat> A few administrative notes before we begin. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on Techopedia within a few days. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. Funding that DTIC provides enables HDIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Jeffrey Musk. Currently serves as the Chief Nuclear Detection Division, Nuclear Technologies Department, Research and Development Directorate for the Defense Threats Reduction Agency, DITRA. Dr. Musk served over 28 years in the U.S. Army, primarily as a nuclear and counter -pro proliferation officer, retiring as a colonel in 2014. For his final military assignment, he served as the Deputy Director, Office of Proliferation Detection, Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation R&D at the National Nuclear Security Administration of the DOE. Uh, I'll uh, now turn the presentation over to Dr. Musk. Good afternoon, Jeff. The floor is now yours. Uh, thanks, Steve, and thanks for uh, uh, hosting this talk today. I'm uh, look forward to giving it. Uh, um, again, I'm, I'm Jeff Musk. I'm Chief Nuclear Detection here at Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, affectionately known as either DITRA or DTRA, also affectionately known as Did They Reorganize Again, um, because we are kind of known for uh, changing, uh, changing, changing the deck chairs around here quite a bit. Um, we've just gone through a de defense-wide review, which I think a lot of us out there have uh, had some experience with, so it remains to be seen whether uh, we live up to our name and reorganize again uh, in response to some of the actions that have come out of a de defense-wide review. Um, either way, I don't. What I'm going to talk about today, I think, is going to be largely unaffected by that. Um, so, um, what I what I what I hope to convey today is where we're going in nuclear detection R&D here at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and some of the new uh, some new areas we've moved into, and how things have really changed over the last few years in the nuclear detection world. Things are very different now in 2019 than they were when I retired in 2014 and, and took the, took this job. Our focus has has dramatically changed over the last five years, largely due to changes in national policy, which is what I'll talk about today. So here's what I'll cover, a little bit of DITRA history for those of you who don't know it. I think probably most of the folks on the line have a pretty good, pretty good idea of DITRA and where it's been, although I'll point out a couple interesting things, I think, from my point of view. And uh, then the last part of the briefing is really more specific on what we do in nuclear technologies here at DITRA and in my division, the nuclear detection division, and focusing on some of the areas we see as really growth areas in nuclear detection R&D going forward. And when we get to that point, I'll talk about what exactly I mean by nuclear detection, because it's not just what you'd standardly think as ionizing radiation detection, Geiger counters and, and scintillators and things like that. It's actually broader than that in this context. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, to start off, uh, here's basically a timeline of, uh, of the evolution of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency tracing its roots all the way back to the Manhattan Project. And I would say, um, as it's currently constituted, Defense Threat Reduction Agency contains a lot of different elements, but I'd say the core that can trace its roots all the way back to the Manhattan Project is really where the Nuclear Detection Division resides in DITRA, here in the Nuclear Technologies uh, Department, headed by Dr. Michael Koyasha. So one thing I noticed, that it's, you know, so if, you, if you trace our history, a lot of the early part of what we did was really involved in the underground nuclear testing program and the survivability of DOD systems, and as such, in fact, uh, I was fortunate enough early in my career to be assigned to Defense Threat Reduction, I mean, she asked me time, it was a Defense Nuclear Agency uh, in the early 90s, and I got to participate in Hunter's Trophy, which was the second to last uh, UGT back in uh, September of 92. So that was a, that was a fun experience. Um, but I note here, though, is that when you think of, think of DTRA and its roots in Defense Nuclear Agency, you notice that 
DNA was around for about 25 years. And if you notice, DITRA has been around since 1998, so we're actually approaching uh, the longevity of, of, of DNA, which, which I found was interesting when I was, when I was taking, a, taking a look at this slide. But this slide really points out all the different things we've been involved in and, and what, we've been, what we've been involved in uh, over the years and what our current focus is now. Um, coming out of defense-wide review, I mean, I think the future of the improvised threat mission, I think, is the one that is, that is in, some, uh, in some flux based on how the defense-wide review comes out. So we'll see if that, if that uh, um, causes any, any more changes uh, in either the R&D directorate or DITRA as a whole. So here is the here's the mission of, of the agency. Essentially, uh, DITRA is dual-hatted as both a combat support agency and a defense agency, and we are the primary uh, agency that looks at combating weapons of mass destruction. And as DOD, obviously, we are more focused uh, externally, OCONUS, than internally. Although we can certainly provide support when asked. So what the graphics on the slide are showing is that uh, the combat our primary customers within DOD of uh, combatant commands, with really the primary ones that DITRA spends most of its attention on these days, being SOCOM, who is coordinating WMD activities across the department, and STRATCOM with strategic deterrent, which has taken on increased emphasis with the new nuclear posture review. I'd say a close second in emphasis for us these days would be uh, UCOM and PACOM. Again, uh, with the change to great power competition and away from a, a pretty much a sole focus on the VEO threat and lost and stolen nuclear weapons, um, that has put increased emphasis on uh, these other areas. The graphic to, to the left really shows how DITRA interacts around the, the interagency. I say here in detection, our closest, our closest partnership interagency-wise in R&D with detection is... Uh, NNSA, or National Nuclear Security Administration, specifically NA22, because uh, they have a pretty large program in nuclear detection too. So we 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 have we've had quite a bit of success over the years taking technologies uh, from NA22 uh, that we saw as promising for DoD and developing them further and getting them into the hands of the warfighter. We used to have a I would say a a more robust relationship with the Department of Homeland Security back when there was a domestic nuclear detection office. But with its change to the combating WMD office and changes in basically how that uh, department's done business, that has really uh, that has really fallen off over the last few years to the point where where we used to have quarterly meetings with the PMs from DNDO and NA22 and us to deconflict what we're doing and look at S SBIRs and STTRs and such. Uh, that's really just a collapse down to just us and NA22 at this point. So. I'm hoping, I'm hoping as, as time moves on and, and as leadership has changed on that end that uh, the relationship with DNDO begins to ramp back up again. So within research and development, there's a couple things, I'm not going to read the slide, but a couple things i like to highlight. Uh, we want to avoid technical surprise uh, and, and um, addressing requirements. Now that's a that's a tough balancing act, really, in R and D because uh, not all R and D sh should be requirements driven in the sense that you have a you have a, a JSID requirement. You have to be doing just those things to have a to have a vibrant R and D program. You also have to have what we call push technologies, technologies that we think are going to be valuable to the customer, the DoD customer going forward, because of our knowledge of the technology that's that's under development not just here, but around the community, and what the needs of our customers are. I mean, one of the things we pride ourselves in is, is our very frequent engagement with all our customers and knowing the ins and outs in great detail of what their missions are and what their needs are so we can tailor our R&D program to address those needs. So we do have written requirements for most of the folks we support that are, that are pretty detailed, but again, we'd like to keep part of the portfolio, uh, more of that push technology, more looking forward, um, something that's not going to be put in the hands of the warfighter in the next couple of years, but something that may be important five or ten years from now. That's, that's obviously a smaller fraction of what we do, but it is, it is a key part of what we do. And that addresses, in the, in the vision part of this slide, the, the, the drive for technical innovation. 
Um, and uh, so that's what we which we put our focus in over the years. But again, it's it's a balancing act. So within within the research and development uh, directorate here at DHRA, which is headed by Dr. Reese Williams, who actually was my uh, was my boss when I was on my last active duty assignment over in A22, and now he's now he's over here. Um, there is an R&D strategy document here at, at DITRA and, and following the CWMD strategic objectives. And so on the next slide, I'll show both the R&D thrust areas here at DITRA based on these, these large tenants from the, uh, from the DOD strategy for combating WMD, understanding the threat of control and the safeguards. You'll see that on the next slide, and I can, I'll focus on where detection actually falls in since that's the focus of, of this particular talk. So, I place most of our work that we do in that uh, the top most block, understand the environment, threats, and vulnerabilities. Most of the detection work really falls, here we do at DITRA, really falls in, in, in those research R&D thrusts uh, that you see there. Although I would also say that we do have activities that support, support the other two. Um, but our main focus is this understand the threat, environment and threats. And that's what I'm going to focus on going forward, um, looking at how the threat has actually evolved and what our focus, what our focus is now. Because again, like I mentioned at the very start, the the, the focus now is is 180 degrees from where it was just, just five five years ago from, from my perspective here in detection. So a lot of us grew up uh, and you know I started my military career back during the Cold War in the, in the, in the early to mid eighties and at least at that time, at least we uh, we had the belief, and we did actually train to operate in nuclear environments and uh, and deal with those type of issues. I remember in, in ROTC days, down at Fort Bragg doing a training. You know, we see the flash. What do you do? Uh, filling out the reports uh, and all the things that that were part of the training process back in the 80s. However, when the Cold War uh, came to an end, and particularly after being an Army guy, the, the Army uh, no longer had tactical nuclear weapons. Um, things things really changed, and you just the emphasis on operating in a nuclear environment, all things nuclear, particularly in the Army, I think, uh, really began to, to go away. And a number of folks now, probably still remaining on active duty from that period, is, is probably very, very small. Um, so, and that was exacerbated by 9-11. Um, because then the focus really became even more strongly away from great power competition, uh, nuclear deterrence, and was was reasonably so and rightfully so on counterterrorism, the VEO threat, and counterinsurgency operations. Again, not a whole lot of nuclear parts, not a whole lot of emphasis on nuclear in that time period. However, with the administration change a, few, a couple of years ago and the new national security strategy, national defense strategy, and new nuclear posture review, the focus the focus changed from an exclusive focus on VEOs, lost or stolen nuclear weapons, to the actual great power competition with the realization that uh, conflict, potential conflict uh, with Russia or China is is something at least you know we have to think more about and plan more about. So even in nuclear detection, that really changed the focus of what we do and some of the things we do. Although I'd point out that pretty much everything that we do in nuclear detection R&D can support both missions. In fact, uh, our strategy statement used to be for my division that we would uh, leverage technologies developed for um, SOCOM and our other uh, um, customers to apply to operating on a nuclear environment. So, so that's so that's when what have been the big change. So as we move forward, the focus really now is on this uh, reemergence of long-term strategic competition by Russia and China. Now it's not to say that the uh, um, VEO threat has gone away or that the probabilities have really changed. It's still something we have to concern ourselves. And I'd say one of the luxuries we have here in nuclear detection R&D at DITRA is that no matter which where the focus is, whether it be on great power competition or whether it be on addressing lost or stolen nuclear weapons and the VEO threat, the technologies applied to both those problem sets are essentially the same. Really what changes is the messaging and, and, and the application of those technologies. So 
uh, Nuclear Protection Division here at DITRA, I think, is well positioned no matter which way the political winds blow as far as what is the focus. Is it, is it, is it great power competition, or do we do a shift back to a world of nuclear zero and the biggest threat being a loss of stolen nuclear weapon? Either way, I think the R&D here in detection uh, is well positioned to support to support uh, you know either either course of action. Again, it does it doesn't take a whole lot of research to go back and look at previous uh, nuclear posture reviews and 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 to the current one and and just really see how much is how much has changed. Nuclear terrorism being the greatest threat to great power competition, uh, nuclear zero to now nuclear weapons play a critical role in national defense. Uh, the possibility that new nuclear capabilities could be developed, uh, and you know, a, you know, a possible resume to testing. Although my personal opinion is that's probably quite, quite unlikely at this point. Um, but, it, but again, the documents really um, do reflect a, a shift in national policy and a, and a shift in thought about how we're thinking about the nuclear problem, and, uh, and that has certainly. Um, Certainly shown itself here at Ditter, and what is what is the what are the priorities, uh, and and what is you know what is being funded. This one uh, actually is supposed to be hidden, but we'll go through it anyway. So um, levels of conflict. I mean, so great power competition is there, but I think the, but a lot of focus right now, and it's not really I don't think I actually see the actual words on this particular slide, are you know these conflicts below. Uh, conflict below the actual armed conflict, the gray zone type of type of activities, which is uh, kind of a mix between the great power competition and uh, and uh, and the VEO threat. I'm getting I'm getting a connectivity error here. Oh, am I guess I think I'm back uh, or not? Uh, you're you're okay. Uh, we okay. we hear we hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, I, hopefully, hopefully things are things are fine. Um, I'm not sure if a slide's advancing, but we'll see. I can't advance the slide, I don't think. Yeah, I'm having technical technical. Oh, here we go. No, got it. It, it came back. All right. So at this, from this point on, we'll focus on uh, nuclear technologies here at DITRA. I'll end with uh, and, and go around the horn here and then uh, really focus on nuclear threat detection, my branch uh, for the remain or my division for the remainder for the remainder of the talk. So you can read the mission there for nuclear technologies department, um, and you can see the different uh, the different activities we have within the nuclear technologies. So we actually have five divisions uh, within nuclear technologies, nuclear weapons effects, nuclear threat detection, which is, which is myself, nuclear survivability, nuclear war fighting dominance. And as of April 1st, we also have an integration division, which is actually uh, not shown on this slide. So starting with the weapons effects, uh, that, that is probably, that plus survivability, probably the two parts of nuclear technologies which can, you know, most directly trace its heritage back to the Defense Nuclear Agency and all the way back to the beginnings of the nuclear program. Now what's changed is back during the 80s and 70s and before, uh, when the scenario was essentially global thermonuclear war and there were hundreds or thousands of weapons coming over the pole, uh, the, the weapons effects type of calculations you had to do in that scenario didn't have to be all that uh, finely tuned and not all that precise in the sense of, uh, of, of um, you know, a single weapon used in, in an urban environment was really not, the, not what the models were designed for. They were more, more designed for the, 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 the bigger scenario of many weapons. So what's changed, what's changed recently is that that threat has has is is thought to be re relatively small. So the focus lately has been on on the use of small numbers of of weapons and what those effects could be uh, on uh, you know in an urban environment, other environments, and it's really shifted from a, a previously an exclusive focus on primary nuclear weapons effects, blast, thermal fallout, uh, prompt radiation, to Secondary and tertiary effects of things that could happen, and whether whether you, whether you know use of a weapon by an adversary or whether use by us or our allies um, actually accomplishes the effect the effect that was sought. So um, a lot of work has shifted, a lot of network analysis type thing is going on in weapons effects, in addition to continued work 
on primary effects such as uh, you know fire and things like that. Nuclear survivability. Traditionally, that's been how do DOD systems survive in a nuclear environment, with a real emphasis on survivability to electromagnetic pulse and to prompt radiation. So a lot of work done in the you know the UGT UGT days on ground nuclear testing was uh, radiation effects on different components, uh, space systems, and others, and how they'd respond. So this is the legacy legacy of those type programs. There's, there's been a lot of emphasis on EMP. There's an EMP and an executive order out there, which is uh, which is uh, um, generating a lot of interest in this area, and so they've they're being kept quite busy. Uh, back in the old days of Defense Nuclear Agency, uh, DITRA had or DNA had many facilities where it did a lot of its uh, actual testing on it itself. It owned a lot of test facilities and, and test equipment. That largely went away about 10 or 15 years ago, probably closer to 15 years ago now, and so now a lot of it is. Uh, is run a different way, but um, it's, the survivability problem remains uh, of, of utmost importance. Now, nuclear warfighting dominance is is a new division. That's actually that used to actually be our nuclear forensics division. So, uh, which which focus was on post at nuclear forensics for attribution. Since since the requirements are somewhat lacking for us in that area right now, uh, it's been repurposed. There's still some still some of that work going on in the nuclear warfighting dominance uh, division, but uh, the two main two main activities that remain in there now are the nuclear arms control technology program, which runs the IMS stations for the Comp comprehensive test ban treaty organization. And uh, also a new group we stood up to do to do war gaming, both war gaming for acquisition and actually um, providing assistance to folks who run war games within DoD and elsewhere to make the nuclear effects and uh, nuclear gameplay more realistic than it has been in the past. A lot of times in the past with war gaming, uh, a nuke a nuke would uh, uh, be used in this scenario, and people would say, "Oh, game over." Uh, and, you know, it's either that that's Stratcom's responsibility, or you know, world's ends, and so we we can't do anything else. Well, if the focus is now in operating in a nuclear environment and the possibility of 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 tactical nuclear weapons being used, we we have to not stop the game at that point, but actually figure out how to realistically operate and and what that actually means. So for war gaming. Uh, part of our new wargaming cell is, is aimed to do that, which leaves us with my division, which is nuclear threat detection. So I have I have two branches, um, two branches of my division. One is focused on traditional radiation detection, ionizing radiation detection, everything from wearable detection to to, uh, to imagers to helium through replacement technologies to different types of scintillators, materials research. Um, everything that, that goes to actually detecting ionizing radiation. My other branch is actually our, our call my threat detection branch, which really looks at any other technology which can be applied to localizing, identifying, and characterizing a nuclear threat, whatever that may be, whether that be uh, a state vehicle uh, that, that uh, is transporting nuclear weapons from point A to point B, how do we how do we figure out where it is, where it's going? How can we reacquire it if, if, if uh, at a later time? Uh, so any other type of sensor, any other type of technology, and, 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 and I mean pretty much anything at this point that can be applied to the identifying and characterizing a nuclear target of interest and, and locating that um, is, is, can be in the purview of that branch. So by its nature then, my portfolio has uh, really spans a, a very vast uh, swath of technologies, e everywhere from sensors that could be on on satellites in orbit to uh, to, to TLDs to uh, to rad sensors to, to seismic to acoustic to uh, vehicle tracking to anything. So it's it it makes for a rather rather challenging uh, rather challenging portfolio to manage just because of sheer sheer breadth of the different types of technologies. Uh, that we deal with, which really I think sets us apart from some of the other parts of nuclear technologies, which are really more laser focused on on very specific aspects of the nuclear problem, whether that be effects or survivability, or war gaming or whatever. So we have a very very broad swath here that we are uh, that we're working on. So when I came in, I, I basically laid down the law on on some things that uh, for, for how we're going to approach research and development uh, here in uh, here in nuclear detection division here at DITRA. 
Um, first of all, we will no longer be developing uh, neutron detection uh, detectors that depend on helium-3. I'm not, and I have nothing against helium-3. Folks will continue to use it, but it's not really new technology. So we've really put our focus on helium-3 replacement technologies. Now, you may ask why, why bother at all with that. Uh, there, was, there was a time, again, 10, 15 years ago, where, where the thought was that there was going to be a shortage of helium-3 based on a type of portal that was being considered at the time. Um, and so the thought was that helium-3 prices are going to spike, there's going to be a shortage because it's all going to be used up uh, for, this, for, this other, for this other use. Turns out that did not actually happen, um, and helium-3 is, is, is still expensive, but it's not unreasonably so. So uh, it is still available. However, again, um, we're R&D, so we're trying to move beyond the older technologies to, to different things. And we've had, a, we've had a work area for helium-3 replacement technologies for some time. We don't have that work area, but, we're, but that our, our, anything we do in neutron detection will not involve helium-3. But number, but number two one is no cryogenic cooling. You know, as we're developing things for Department of Defense and for the warfighter, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a detector that you have to, you know, bring in, plug in, sit down, and has to has to cool and stabilize for for 12 hours or 24 hours for for it to work. Uh, so cooling is fine, but but something that it's going to take a long time to cool and uh, and and those tend to be fragile are, are not things that that we routinely uh, develop. And in fact, we we don't. We haven't developed anything that depends on cryogenic cooling since uh, since I've been here, which also which also highlights the point that because we're developing for DoD and that's really a, a different customer, particularly the warfighter and the type of folks who are going to handle this equipment, we have an extreme emphasis on size, weight, power, and I'll add in ruggedization. Um, it's very different uh, to design a detector or technology which is going to be used in the lab by a scientist. Or, or uh, in a civilian, in, in a lot of civilian applications, to something that is actually going to be deployed in, in harsh environments and have to deal with dust and rain and weather and humidity and, and dryness and, and every every other extreme environment that we deal with in DoD, and you know have to have to you know be able to withstand shaking and vibrations and being dropped and, and all kinds of insults. So. We have an extreme, uh, you know, extreme emphasis on on making sure that the equipment we develop is survivable in that sense, which is a different sense of the word survivability than what our survivability uh, division works on with regards to larger systems and EMP and things like that. This is survival to you know soldier survival, as I like to say. Everything everything these days needs to be networked. Uh, one of the things we've we've really helped push is the mobile field kit, uh, which is a C CBRN plug-in to the to TAC, the tactical assault kit, which is very widely used within DoD. So everything is networkable, and that's that's really a, that's forms a basis of what we're doing forward. Um, some of our other projects to again allow U.S. forces to operate uh, better on a nuclear environment and get the information they need. The last one was, was a recent ad from a couple years ago. Um, active interrogation means using probing something with uh, a, a type of ionizing radiation, whether that be neutrons or, or high-energy photons or charged particles or whatever. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue we looked at in the past for wide area search, but you, can't, you really can't come up with a reasonable scenario where that makes any sense. Um, active interrogation, as in the sense that the DHS does it for Cargo screening and things like that is fine, but it's not something we're doing uh, a whole lot in at this point. There is, there is, we do have an intersection with that in some of our, some of the missions we support, but it is not, it is not a, uh, it's not something we are actively doing at this point. No pun intended. Okay, so the next, the next few slides are on on technologies which we see as uh, as that we continue to promote, we have uh, we have developed in the past, and ones we we see a, we see a big future for, and ones that will be a large part of the technologies and the things we transition to DoD over the next few years. But the first one here is boron coated straws, and that's through a company called um, Proportional Technologies Incorporated out of Houston. Uh, this is this is. One of our most reliable and uh, most prominent helium-3 replacement technologies for, for, for neutron detection. It has uh, it has started from a basically simple gas cylinder type detector, and they've, they've they've gone through multiple design iterations to where it's become more and more efficient. In fact, uh, the the latest incarnation of these boron-coated straws 
have a neutron detection equivalency of 10 atmospheres of helium-3. So we are really making a lot of progress here, and uh, and you know, again, without the use without the use of helium-3. You know, another issue with helium-3 besides you know potential cost and potential um, limited supply of helium-3 going down the road is you know it is, it is a highly pressurized gas in a cylinder. So so our our view is. If we can avoid having folks carry around highly pressurized cylinders of gas, that's 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 probably that's probably a good thing. So this is something we we've, we've supported for many years, and and I see uh, this technology being uh, integrated into things we're doing going forward. I'd say the company it's the company itself, uh, you know, it's this is this is more applying that technology now to missions going forward um, um, rather than uh, you know if you're just starting out at this point. It's 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 a, it's a rather mature company at this point. Next thing I talk about is room temperature high resolution. The standard for gamma resolution, uh, you know, for, for gamma spectroscopy has been has high been high purity germanium, which requires cryogenic cooling. And some of the problems I, I mentioned a, f a few uh, a few minutes ago with regards to uh, with regards to not wanting to wait around for things to cool and in, in, in the fragility of uh, high purity germanium and the such. So. There's been quite a bit of emphasis on trying to f discover and locate materials that can get you at least near high purity germanium resolution, but be able to operate at room temperature, perhaps with some more mechanical cooling. And uh, so we, we've CZT has been a uh, has been a has been a pretty big winner for us in that area, uh, including uh, developing some of our uh, um, imagers. We've we've developed some gamma ray imagers. Out of a company called H3D, which is a, which comes out of University of Michigan, uh, Polaris is is a technology developed out of that. Uh, there's a, there's a civilian version of the Polaris gamma ray imager, which most nuclear power plants actually have to help uh, um, visualize uh, gamma sources. What what this what the imagers will do will you can basically bring the bring the uh, detector in the room, turn it on, and within a few minutes you'll have uh, a view of the room on the screen with a heat map essentially of where the gamma sources are. It's 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 really it's really good technology. And that 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 company started from scratch, uh, you know, from us essentially funding them early on. From University of Michigan and spun off to a, to a relatively relatively uh, good sized company at this point. With a robust commercial market, so that's that's been that's been a success for us. Um, next one is uh, dual mode scintillators. So the idea here is that um, dual mode scintillators, in addition to just uh, detecting gamma rays and be able to you know measure measure the energy of gamma rays, can also detect uh, neutrons. So in the same basically in the same size crystal, using uh, pulse shape discrimination and, and other and other means. You can get both neutron and gamma detection out of the same technology. So the the real win here would be if in certain certain gamma detection systems that are out there, you can basically just do a drop-in replacement of these dual mode scintillators for um, for the for the just gamma only scintillators that are there and, and give some additional capability. Of course, that would require some software update software updates and and perhaps some modifications to electronics, but it does save it does save you know the use of a of a whole new detector and um we we maybe we you know one of our one of our biggest uh, transitions in recent years which i think is actually on the next slide so i'll go to that has been our merlin viper system which was uh working with jpo to to upgrade the red nuke sensors on on the on the striker um, um nbc vehicle and uh and so that consisted of three systems. There was uh, there was a module on the inside for crew dose and crew dose rate, which was the Viper module. Then we had the Merlin A, which was uh, four corner detectors on the corners of the vehicles, which in in our initial development was cesium iodide, which is only a gamma detector. Um, the thought would be maybe going forward that there would be a possibility that those those uh, crystals could be replaced by dual mode noise, which would get some some neutron detection capability in addition to the gamma capability. And the Merlin I was the imaging module, which, which, as I talked about a few minutes ago, you know, gave the gave the ability to get a get a view of the uh, terrain around the vehicle, where and locate visually where the gamma sources were. And this, you know, I was at the uh, you know a final testing for this before it was turned over to JPEO uh, a couple of years ago, and and I was able to basically go down the road at at, at a pretty high speed and be able to locate. 
um, sources uh, basically going down the road at speed. Now remember, this 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 is this is this is really a good example of our shift away from the lost or stolen nuclear weapon VEO threat to the operations in a nuclear environment. So the idea in operating in that environment is you're not looking for very low activity, hard to find sources like uh, like uranium, like you are in a VEO mission. This is more for a fallout field or which is a relatively high high dose event. So you're not. This is not aimed at um, you know find you know. Uh, the SNM mission. This is more towards contamination mapping, contamination avoidance. So, um, and uh, so this is this is really demonstrated the ability to do that. It, it was it was actually stunning how much of an improvement this was over the over the current technology when we were going through the T and E with this. And so this leads into our next area, which is rapid rapid radiation mapping. So when you often when people think of rapid radiation mapping, they, the first thing they think think of is uh, is UAVs, and that is part of this. We have a number of projects which uh, which look at uh, mounting radiation detection assets to to UAVs and and being able to map uh, fields on the ground or help to locate relatively strong sources. Uh, in 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 you know in buildings or in urban type environments, and it and it, we've demonstrated that to work to work quite quite well. But we don't see this as, as purely limited to just uh, UAVs, uh, but also ground systems, whether it be unmanned ground systems or any vehicle where you can mount basically mount these mount these detection systems on. And to be clear, we as a nuclear detection division or even DITRA aren't developing UAVs. We're using UAVs as as a means to mount our sensors to to do other missions. I mean, obviously there's, there are some limitations on uh, UAVs and how long you know how long they can fly, what their range is, and and, and the such. So uh, those are challenges going forward with with employing radiation detection on these systems. So what I want to end up with here then is what ties this all together, which is our CBRN situational awareness. And this is the uh, what I talked about a few minutes ago with regards to mobile field kit and 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 TAC. So this is uh, something we've been working on for for many years now. Um, the primary customer early on was the civil support teams and the National Guard Bureau. Which so what this would do is uh, would give the CST commander the ability to see where all his folks were what they were seeing on their detectors and be able to um, see what they were seeing, direct them for where they should go. It gave each of the folks with the, with the detection assets and the sensors the ability to communicate with each other and coordinate and to coordinate much, much better. And uh, we supported uh, the National Guard Bureau and CSTs at, at many, many events uh, and many events over the years, including uh, Super Bowls, All-Star Games, the, the Pope's visit to Philadelphia a few years ago. And uh, and um, this goes back into the fact that uh, detectors need to be networked. Now, I will say that one of the one of the big challenges, not just for us, but I think for all of us out there working in this area, is the communications and bandwidth problem. Um, it's just not unlimited and it's very restrictive. So one of the things we are you know trying to work around is. We have a lot of information that's going to need to flow from the battlefield back to back to the high level commands and back down uh, for decisions, and the bandwidth is just quite small. And if you're talking about a nuclear environment, the communication infrastructure and the the environment could be severely degraded. So working w working around that is going to be one of our one of our R and D challenges going forward. How we how we address how we address some of those some of those issues. So uh, we we have all the work with uh, MFK and TAC over the year. It is it has been uh, it is now a quite a robust system. Again, you know, um, we have we have run this both using commercial cell. We have we have run this off military grade radios. We have done this basically in in, in a number of environments that uh, can, you know that uh, simulate different types of communication degradation. I mean, we found early on supporting some of these big events that the cell network just wasn't up to it, so we had to find alternate means, and we we have done that o over the years. And uh, as it says down below, it is uh, it is network agnostic. We have we have done uh, you know even satellite even satellite uh, linkage with with this at this point. And 
Not just for MFK TAC, but I'll just make this point for, for everything we do uh, going back across the technologies we've discussed, is one of the key elements of what we do in a nuclear detection division is we have a very robust test and evaluation program. And in fact, I have, uh, I, I have a, a, a GS-14 whose sole job is really to run that for me and, and with, with the contract support he has. So when we develop any type of technology, we we run a T and E event early on, as soon as we can get a prototype out to the field, and we bring in the intended customers for that technology, and let them use it in in a realistic in a realistic environment to give us very early feedback on what they think of a technology and what their suggestions are. So that will guide our R and D and and our development of that particular technology going forward. We have made. Um, Pretty large investments at, at a, a T and E site uh, out, uh, owned by Ditra out in Albuquerque, and uh, at that at that site we have uh, we have what we call an international village, which has uh, a number of different structures made from from materials from around the world to simulate backgrounds you might find in those areas. We have a linear test track, which you can either put a detector or source on, which will reliably move back and forth at up to 70 miles an hour repeated, um, repeatedly. We have a container farm, which which you can put sources in, and you can either search by, uh, you know, with uh, folks walking around with detectors in their hand or UAVs or whatever. Um, there are some rail cars there. We can we can do some work in. It's it's got a state of the art con control center, um, you know, a wide variety of sources we can use, and uh, and you know that's one of the, that's one of the uh, that's one of the uh, Areas we, we bring folks in frequently. Now it's not perfect. Albuquerque, as, as most of us know, is at altitude, so it, so it uh, and it is it is the New Me it is New Mexico, so it is it is a certain type of environment. Uh, there is uh, there is some talk of of um, maybe doing some testing at a at a location which you have a different a different environment, to closer to sea level, uh, a little bit more in a way of vegetation and uh, and varying weather. Um, Different than Albuquerque, but uh, that's in the very early stages um, at this point. So to summarize, um, our our R and D here at Ditra is is, is uh, focused on the combating WMD mission, and, and within nuclear technologies, obviously it is it is the the nuclear threat. Um, our our sister directorate, uh, ChemBio, uh, focuses on that aspect of the problem. We've worked with them. Fairly closely on uh, on uh, MFK TAC and trying to work with them to get them into that environment and um, talking to them further on some of these sensor network issues with uh, integrated early warning and integrated sensor ar architecture, which is efforts which are ongoing. So it, it uh, eventually everything needs to needs to feed into the same system. But again, the, the challenge is going to be some of these communication and bandwidth and issues and cybersecurity type things that uh, that are, are problematic with that. Our, our R&D is focused on DOD priorities. And again, those really have changed. I, I remember when I, when I first got here five years ago, we had a briefing for, for, for my boss. And my branch chief for ad detection at that time, you know, was up briefing, and and my boss asked him, "So, what are you doing for the services?" And at the time, the answer was virtually nothing because there was no requirements. They, the services felt that the radiation detection equipment they had was fine for what they needed, uh, and our total focus was on lost or stolen SNM and the VEO threat. Fast forward five years, and now the VEO threat is there, and it's always there, and, and, and so is a tech development for it, but the focus now is really on these technologies to uh, for contamination mapping, contamination avoidance, and operations in the nuclear environment. We work across the interagency um, and internationally. I would say internationally, most of my interaction has been, has been with uh, our friends in the UK. Uh, we were just uh, just there not too long ago for Enhanced Detection Users Group meeting, which is under Joe Wog 29, and uh, discussing mutual uh, mutual technologies in R and D from you know on the UK side and the US side. And uh, with that, um, I would I've just again emphasized that as R and D, we are largely requirements driven. Um, whether that be big R requirements, which are official requirements down through the system, or little R requirements as we call them. Just things we know our customers need by our familiarity with their mission and our interactions with them. So with that, uh, I will close and be happy to answer any any questions for the next uh, next few minutes here.
Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. That's an uh, uh, interesting presentation. And as Jeff said, if anybody has any questions for him, uh, you can just uh, shoot them up on our uh, chat, chat message board there. Uh, I think right now we just have a, a comment uh, that, you know, a particular uh, tactical flare detector using yeah. cryo coolers, uh, you, you know, it has had some success. Uh, but, but like I said, just just wanted to mention that one comment. No, I, see, I, I, see, I, I see. Yeah, I see the comment here on the screen, and that's that, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not I have nothing. Uh, I have uh, nothing against high purity uranium. It's just that it's a uh, we're we're trying to work to the future and and uh, and try to develop technologies which really don't depend on on that type of cooling or that particular material. And, and, and again, same thing with helium three. Helium three works great for neutron detection. Always will. But again, we're trying to move. We're trying to move into the future with uh, more advanced techniques. Again, we're R and D. If you want to, if you want to buy technologies using, you know, high purity uranium and helium three, you you can that you can buy that off the shelf. We're we're, we're trying to develop uh, develop new things uh, with an eye towards the future. Again, nothing against either material. They're both very useful and can be used for many years. But as an R and D organization, we're we're looking more towards, uh, you know, the you know the five and ten year time frame. Uh, I see. I was see a comment here on the role of Sigma. We've uh, we've uh, we had quite a bit of interaction with Sigma early on, um, and I think a lot of what they've done with the networking is going to be particularly useful as we as we develop these systems going forward. Um, we had some part. One of my PMs actually had some part in the Sigma in the Sigma program, uh, the neutron detection part of that, and uh, so we we are you know we have been connected with that. And uh, um, I think that's probably the most appropriate thing uh, to, to, to say on on Sigma. What else we got here? Uh, we've got a we've got a question from the uh, HDIEC uh, director, I who is the formerly the commanding officer of the Seaburf. Uh, he says he struggled to find a good uh, SA tool, and he said, you know, mentioned you did some work on that for right, the so, CSP. Right, so Right, so mobile field kit and TAC are what we're like promulgating as uh, as those situation situational awareness tools. Again, MFK is the uh, is the uh, RN plugin to the, to the TAC system, and um, TAC has been pretty widely adopted through many parts of many parts of DoD. So we think that is that is a probably a winning system going forward. But again, the question is. You have all these sensors, not just rad nuke sensors or CBRN sensors on the benefit, but you have but you have all the other sensors. Are all that piece of information are flowing in, and and how how is that made sense of? How is that communicated? How how are, how are decisions made based on information? How do you make that information make sense at the level it's needed? What what you know the what the person of detector on the ground may need, or the subject matter expert may need with regards to radiation detection information is not going to be the same. As a battalion commander, a brigade commander, or someone at you know the national command levels are going to need, they're going to need uh, the information tailored in a different way. So that's one of the things we're really uh, uh, working towards. And our our new integration division um, here in nuclear technologies, we see as helping us interface with those larger DoD activities that are going on, whether that be the integrated sensor architecture ISA or IEW or some of these other programs that are going on. Okay, and yeah, great. Right. I, see the, I, see the, I see the comment about tracking personnel and those. Yes, that's, that's, that's what it does. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, so I was kind of curious. I know you mentioned, uh, you know, with, uh, with some of those tools, uh, the uh, communications uh, issues, you know, bandwidth. Uh, uh, you mentioned cybersecurity. Uh, so do you, are you doing that, that research yourself and, um, Part of the reason I ask is that uh, I'm, I'm located in, in upstate New York, and kind of in our backyard, we have the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory Information right. Directorate, and, and, and they're working on technologies like that. They have a, um, a controlled, contested environment, and uh, you know things of that nature that you know could be applicable. So, uh, like I said, I was just more curious as to you know how you do that that part of your uh, your investigation. Yeah, I would say that's that's probably not an R and D area that that we we could do. Um, that would be more that we are you know we're advocating for um, what we think needs to be done in that area and 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 tying in with folks that are working at. But you know, as as the nuclear detection division, what we what um, 
really am allowed to work on, you know, I have to draw that, I have to really draw that, that uh, the direct uh, connection to, 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 you know, DOD's nuclear detection mission. And that would, that's more like an enabling capability and something that's, that needs to be. But the actual R&D in that area would, would be something that would, that would likely be done by something else. But one of the things we struggle with is, as I mentioned, I have two, two branches, one which is uh, radiation detection, and um, yeah, very obviously that is nuclear specific because that's ionizing radiation is a nuclear phenomenon. My other branch, like I said, c can have any technology from sensors on satellites to 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 you know things that track vehicles to to anything. And by their nature, since they're not detecting ionizing radiation, they are not nuclear specific sensors. So, you know, and often a question I often have to deal with is, well, gee, why are you working on that? Your nuclear detection, your, you know, you, you know, that's your mission. Why are you working on this technology which doesn't, you know, which isn't, can only just be used for that? Well, you know, the answer is that we're applying these technologies, these different sensors, these these different communication paths, these different information streams to the to the nuclear mission, whether that be operating a nuclear environment or whether that be. Uh, you know, the lost or stolen nuclear weapon problem. Oh, yes, I okay. see. I see. I, I, I yeah, see probably pro yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I see there's a question here for uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yes, uh, we, we do have investments in that area. Again, applied applied to uh, the nuclear, the nuclear um, target of interest of a nuclear threat detection mission. So, yes, absolutely. Okay. There's uh, another uh, another question there. Given the limited number of interceptors and the time it takes uh, to make and field them, uh, individual thinks it's a priority to be uh, towards the nuclear versus conventional ballistic missile discrimination to allow for the interceptor prioritization. Uh, given the complex problem of on-the-fly payload detection of ballistic missiles, assuming high-quality systems by state actors. Uh, what is the most promising solution path, and how long do you think it will take to uh, implement such a system? That actually is not in our purview. That that is that is more in the purview of uh, of the Missile Defense Agency. So that's that is not that is not an area I, I can really reasonably comment on because we're not really we're not here in my my uh, division doing work in that area. One of the things that uh, um, I also get asked is. You know, most of the things I talked about today, uh, and you could see from the slides, were really focused on the ground mission, whether that be technologies for the Army or the Marine Corps or, or maybe special mission units, you know, ground forces, um, and not so much. You don't, see, you don't see as much emphasis on the Navy and the Air Force. I have to say at this point that's largely intentional. You, you have to start somewhere, and frankly, the, you know, the – the environment that the ground forces are going to have to work in is probably the, the biggest concern at, at this point for the technologies we're developing. We, we have had some work in the past with the Navy on preventing, you know, the fleet from, from sailing into a plume, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the, the post-Fukushima type, type, uh, type incidents. And uh, in, Navy, in Air Force, as far as flying around plumes and things like that, but the time scale on that is very different than the, than the ground mission. And as I point out to my boss, we've got to start somewhere. We we haven't got an unlimited budget, and so we have to uh, we have to focus, and our focus right now is on the ground forces. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, thanks for fielding that one. So, uh, another question on uh, asking about the level of interest in settling the uh, coupling effects of uh, gammas and neutrons and uh, prompt yes. environment for electronic yes, survivability. Uh... Right. So, so that that work is specifically being addressed in our nuclear survivability division. That is exactly the kind of uh, the kind of work that they do. They they work at all kinds of issues. So it's it's uh, I'd say it primarily resides in our survivability division, uh, with also probably a, a a piece of that coming out of uh, of, of our effects division also. Okay. And I think there's a comment here about the, you know MDA on 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 the missile discrimination thing. I, I would say. Um, we have awareness of it, but I would say that's it, it, that the ball is still like primarily in their court for that. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so, any other questions for Jeff? Uh, otherwise, I think we've uh, we've run through the list of uh, 
questions that have been thrown out there. So um, if if uh, everybody is, uh, uh, we will be we will be posting a copy of the uh, briefing slides uh, on uh, Techopedia along with a recording of the um, the webinar presentation that that'll be up on uh, Techopedia um, at, at, at this point in time. So that that's where you can that's where you can find it. And uh, so, Jeff, I once again I want to thank you for uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, you know, it's uh, very interesting, and it's a uh, you know critically uh, important work that you're doing. Uh, we appreciate the uh, you know the the efforts that you're you're involved in, and thank you for sharing the information with our uh, with our HDI Act community here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I was glad to do it, uh, and uh, and again, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending today, and I'd just like to wish everybody happy holidays, and we look forward to seeing you at another event in the new year. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now.